We have a crisis in healthcare, a serious crisis right now. And I, I and this is this is pragmatic optimism in the long run, but it's it's going to be a difficult period here, where we have been losing clinicians. Uh, for a number of years, the numbers of clinicians. And at the same time, we have an aging population that requires more and more care. And there's all kind of science gonna help us, you know, not just uh, AI, there's gonna be new pharmaceuticals, there's gonna be new scientific innovations that help us detect disease earlier and all those kinds of things. But for the next few years, this is a right now problem, which probably many of you uh, people have already experienced, which is suddenly you can't get in to see a specialist. It'll take you months in most cases. And you're very likely gonna see a nurse practitioner who is a gatekeeper for the specialist. Real common problem right now, it's gonna get worse. The only way that we can see today, and I say we, I think those of us who you know are trying to build something better, is two things, disparities and having enough physician time or clinician time. And that is to be a force multiplier. What artificial intelligence and other technologies can be are force multipliers. They take a person and they create more than a person. I don't know whether you're aware of this, but I'm sure you've run across it, that one of the things we've talked about for 30 years in healthcare is people operating below their license. Everybody does. It means that I'm doing, if I'm a nurse, I'm doing non-nurse work. They're administrative tasks, they're, they're documentation tasks, and, and that takes uh, somewhere between 15 and 30% of, of all, virtually every clinician's time. The very first place we can use artificial intelligence is it does those tasks. So now we get 30% more of nurses. That's one of the ways that AI could very quickly, we could see the impact. Uh, we may have to become accustomed to having a preliminary diagnosis, like where you would go to your primary care doc, um, done with AI assistance. It'll probably be better, you know, because they, it can ask a lot of the same questions. It can go through the questions, the preliminary questions the doctor or the nurse asks us, uh, and, and then pass you to the doctor. So all of those things save time. And so one of the ways we work out of the healthcare crisis we're in is through AI. So that's a positive. The second connection is personalization. Now that's not going to happen overnight, but if we don't have AI to help us, we'll never get there. And personalized medicine jumps over the problems of disparity because it's all driven to the individual. And because you can produce it a lot more economically, that'll be the great one of the great fixes of disparity. And it's not 30 years from now. It may be 10, but it's not 30. There are a lot of devices continuing to come out, the aura ring the what, the Apple Watch. I mean, for the first time, you get instant feedback. It monitors your heart rate 24 seven, tells you how well you sleep, and uh, your st monitors your stress levels. Uh, it will help you, motivate you to get uh, uh, more steps in every day, because it counts every step you take, and you'll look down and go, wow, I got 6,000, I've just been working around the house. I'm gonna go walk for 20 minutes and break that 10,000 mark. That's, a, that's a, an easy one for people to do, and it really works. The wearables are becoming really powerful, and there's, there's a real scientific opportunity here that we've never had before, which is longitudinal monitoring of large population. That's really significant, and these are not terribly expensive uh, devices. Give it another five years, and they'll be affordable by everybody. Whether it's uh, the Aura Ring, whether it's, uh, it's, it's watches, uh, whether it's a, a health ban, these things are really starting to, to, to bite. What if Gene Roddenberry, Star Trek, got it right that you remember the the charge to the Star Trek people was go forth and explore don't interfere with the evolution of all those races you see but if you can kind of help a little bit that's okay but but you can't interfere with their evolution artificial intelligence could maybe help take us there 
because this, the challenges of travel into space and so forth uh, right now at least exceed human capability because remember they had warp speed we don't have that right <laughs> so we haven't invented anything like that yet but what if those explorers are androids what if they are human values the human history but they can travel forever and theoretically live forever and charged with the right mission maybe could do that kind of good that's a wild idea but it's possible it's conceivable i mean we're now you know, if you watch their articles right now, there is definitely a way to capture and digitize you and I, capture our entire history, our value system and everything, uh, and to put that inside of a mechanical robot that could theoretically live forever. The 21st century should be the age of the elevation of human potential. AI done right, that's, we, you know, we talked about here's something, healthcare can be, it can be a huge thing. Someday it can promote, you know, uh, enable a kind of space travel we couldn't possibly do as human beings for centuries, if not millennia. But it can also elevate what we do as automation, AI being part of automation, but other kinds of automation as well, as it, it will assume the work that is repetitious, dangerous, and it requires a lot of physical exertion. It will allow us over time to, uh, to focus on a much higher quality work so that I don't imagine people in a declining population that we're putting all these people walking around without jobs, not for very long because we need every one of them. And, and I, I tell uh, you know audiences that uh, I hope to look out my window someday and there are no landscapers. Uh, there's one guy out there with a joystick and he's doing everything. And you know, everybody goes, oh, they look at it immediately negatively. Well, what are all those people gonna do? Well, I happen to believe in human beings more than that. I believe all those people doing repetitious work, that's not good human work. We're creative sorts. We're good at human relationships. We're good at complex problems that are very difficult to try to figure out the answer, but we're creative and we'll, we'll go at it. That's better work for human beings. So give that 20, 30 years, human beings could be doing a whole different level of work, much more satisfying. Repetitious, I don't know anybody that loves repetitious work. We all have repetitious work around the house we don't particularly like doing. So those things could all be automated with AI. The AI that is pervasive right now, the breakthrough that happened in the last couple of years is what's called large language models, llamas. In, in short terms, you can talk to a computer and understand you and talks back. That's pretty freaking amazing, whether it's in text, whether it's in voice, and soon it'll be in video as well. And that's the breakthrough for the lower income folks. Because now I don't have to have any technology other than a phone, and most people have a phone. And, and I can now just tell my computer or interact with the computer, interact about healthcare in a way that I never could. And right now we're all talking about AI, but the, the real breakthrough, that is a new brain to computer interface is voice. I don't need a keyboard and I don't need a screen. That's gonna revolutionize healthcare, education, everything like we've never seen before. The CEO of Google uh, said, that he believes that artificial intelligence is, the, is on the level of the invention of fire. Now think about that. Wow, if he's right or if he's half right. But I imagine when fire was invented that nine out of 10 people said, this is wonderful. We can cook our food. We can stay warm. We can be safe from animals now. And 10% of the people said, Aha, we can use this to burn down our enemies' huts. That's just, that's life. So if we think we're gonna invent great things and somebody's gonna try, try to figure out how to do bad things with it, that's just not the way the world works. And we have to say, okay, that's coming, so what are we gonna do about it? When we invent new pharmaceuticals, they're required to go through a rigorous testing process to understand how it, what the harm it could do, how to use it, and we haven't learned to do that yet with technology. And so we have to be smarter about that in the future.